As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. This is episode number 39, or edition number, uh, I'm sorry, 38. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, edition 38 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of January 5th to January 11th, 2012. And um, uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me and that I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, whatever about the show, you can contact me directly. My email address is hoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you missed that, my website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere uh, a couple of times during the show. And you can do a search on that and go there and get the email address from there. The one request I will ask of you, uh, if you do write to me, is that in the subject line you say something like your show or left side of the aisle or something like that so that I know it's not spam. Okay, I'm going to start now a couple of things. This is one of those weeks where I really wish the show was an hour because there's a whole lot of stuff I'm not going to get to. But there's a couple of things I said I was going to talk about today, so I want to make sure that I do. So right at the top, I'm going to tell you that the Iowa caucuses will not be discussed here. Nor will the New Hampshire primary, the South Carolina primary, uh, Super Tuesday, or any of the rest of that. Uh, I'm not going to spend any of my time going over Mitt Romney's latest flip-flop about Ron Paul, but isn't he great on the wars, connections to homophobia and racism. I'm not going to spend any of my time talking about Michelle Gingrich or Newt Perry or Rick, I should be in a sanitarium. Um, I admit, now, I do watch some of the, um, you know, the, the liberal news shows, like the Young Turks and Keith Olbermann, and I do sometimes watch some of the more classically liberal shows, and by classical I mean, I mean from a time when the word liberal actually meant something worthwhile. Uh, people like Ed Schultz and Rachel Maddow. Um, and of course I, you know, check out the blogosphere and so on, but the, in the last, over the last weeks, I have been incredibly frustrated with these shows because they have spent, it seems, half their time, if not more, talking about the Republican presidential primaries. And this is months before even the first caucuses have happened. Uh, now, the thing is, I know where they do it. They do it because it's fun for them. All this, the horse race crap, the, uh, the polling, all of the, you know, who said the dumbest thing of the day derby. Um, that's all great fun. But get a grip, people. It's not that important. And the thing is, it doesn't deserve that much attention. And you know it doesn't deserve that much attention. And the way we can know is because you spend a significant part of your time coverage of Iowa talking about how in the long run, Iowa really doesn't matter. And you say this just before you go on blathering about Iowa. Now, I did look at the results. I had, you know, admit to having a passing curiosity about the outcome. But I say this to every ostensible, ostensibly liberal news program, every uh, ostensibly liberal news station, and in fact, to a good part of the liberal blogosphere, many of whom has been every bit as guilty, there are other things going on in the world, people. Other things, more important things, lots of them. In fact, here's one going on, which uh, you may have heard about, or you may not have, if you depend upon our conventional news media outlets. The coalition government in Iraq is splintering, and there's a significant risk of a renewed civil war. Now, I said last week I was going to talk about the domestic crisis in Iraq, so I'm going to do that now. Um, the thing is, the coalition government in Iraq, this government that was formed, formed after a painful, months-long political struggle, it's, it's always been fragile. Uh, Iraq's ethnic and religious groupings uh, remain separated, both geographically and politically. Uh, a separation that was only been accentuated by our invasion and occupation, which actually unleashed, um, repressed ethnic divisions. In fact, um, the um, ethnic divisions in Iraq could actually be illustrated very simply by a map. So we got, we're going to get a graphic up here. Uh, it's it's uh, Iraq 1, it's called. Um, this map shows the provinces of Iraq by the ethnic group that is uh, dominant there. The western part of Iraq in the pale blue is predominantly Sunni. The light reddish brown in the southeast is Shiite, and the yellowish area in the north is Kurdish. 
The only sort of truly multi-ethnic area is Kirkuk, which is that dark blue patch in the middle. There are some other significant minorities, uh, Turkmen who are marked by circles, uh, the Assyrians and Chaldeans by crosses, and the uh, Yazidi by slashes. But basically, it's Sunni Arab, Shiite Arab, and or Muslim, uh, sorry, Sunni Muslim, Shiite Muslim, and Kurdish. Okay, now let's take that down. We're going to bring up the next graphic. The next graphic. This graph shows the results of the parliamentary elections in Iraq in the spring of 2010. Again, it's, in this case, it's by what party won each province. The dark blue is, is al Arakaya or the Iraqi list. Uh, that's a Sunni party. The pale blue area is the State of Law Coalition. That's a Shiite party. In fact, it's uh, the Prime Minister's party. The green area is the Iraqi National Alliance, which is also a Shiite party. And the yellow is the Kurdistan Alliance. That's Iraq today, divided ethnically, both geographically and politically. Just to make the point, let's bring those two, those two maps up side by side so you can see both of them. They're not quite to the same scale, uh, but the point is clear. Ethnically and politically, Iraq is not one nation. It is a pastiche of three. It doesn't mean it has to stay that way. But it does point up the fragility of the present moment. All right, we're going to take those graphics down. Take those down. Um, and uh, while it's been rough, it's been tense, it's been troubled, the fact is, so far, Iraq has managed to avoid having a complete fracture. The fact that that is now a new, a renewed possibility, a renewed possibility of fracture, a renewed possibility of civil war, uh, the fact that that is again so real, the fact that Iraq is again so close to the brink is the result of the actions of one man, Prime Minister Nuri al Malakai. He's a Shiite, as I said, as I've indicated before, he's uh, part of the, um, the uh, law party. Um, he became Prime Minister as a compromise choice, but he's turning into a new strong man. In November, in conveniently in the midst of the like preparations for the final U.S. withdrawal of troops from Iraq, Malachi uh, arrested 615 former members of the Ba'ath Party, most of whom basically were now members of al Iraqiya, uh, which basically means he arrested a large number of his political opponents. He did this supposedly based on a tip from the new government of Libya that there was a Sunni plot against him. In mid-December, he ordered the arrest of three bodyguards of Vice President Tariq al-Hashimi. Al uh, uh, Hashimi is a Sunni. He's a member of al Iraqiya. He did this uh, uh, accusing these three of terrorist activity. A few days later, with televised confessions of the three as backdrop, um, Malachi ordered the arrest of Hashimi himself, ordered the arrest of the vice president. Hashimi is now taking refuge in the largely autonomous Kurdish region in the north, and Malachi is making vague threats about what will happen if the Kurds don't turn him over, while at the same time blocking any attempts to move the case from Baghdad to the more neutral territory of Kirkuk. Um, meanwhile, other political opponents of Malachi have occasionally wakened to find tanks around their house. Now, it's something that's worth noting here. The terror activity of which Hashimi is now accused dates from five years ago. This will put it in 2006. This was the very peak, the very height of the sectarian violence in Iraq. And I have to truly wonder, is there anybody in the government of Iraq, including Malachi, who could not be accused of terrorist activity if that's the standard you're going to use? Malachi, um, oh, members of the Al-Qurri bloc, announced on December 17th that because of the arrest of their members, they're going to be boycotting the parliament, not taking part in the parliamentary sessions. Uh, Malachi responded by threatening to dismiss the Sunni members of the cabinet and replace them with interim appointees, even though those appointees would not have the legally required approval of the Council of Representatives. Uh, Arakaya claimed Malachi doesn't have the power to do this, and According to the group, they warned that if he did this, it would break down the political process completely. Malachi also wants Parliament to uh, pass a no-confidence motion 
against Deputy Prime Minister Salah al-Mutlaq, who was another senior member of al qaeda another Sunni. This is after, on December 21st, he put Mutlaq on extended leave. And Malachi's actually suggested he wants to do away with the power-sharing agreement. What's more, the sectarian divisions in Iraq, in the wake of all this, are increasing. Uh, Iraq, already severely divided, is becoming even more divided, even more ethnically divided. Sunni residents still, who are still living in and around Baghdad in predominantly Shiite areas are being threatened, and they're moving. In fact, so much so, this, it's, divisions are so much so, that in the past three months, three Sunni provinces in Iraq, Anbar, Salahuddin, and Diyala, have each pushed for a public vote on creating their own regional government. So this is something permitted under the Constitution, but it's something which Malachi warns will produce rivers of blood. In mid-December, when the governor of, of Diyala, now Diyala is the most, of those three uh, Sunni, predominantly Sunni uh, province I mentioned, Diyala is the most ethnically, ethnically diverse. When uh, the governor of Diyala proposed uh, making Diyala a region, which, which would mean, again, that's what it's called, uh, would mean having more autonomy, more local powers and control, well, Malachi openly opposed that, and this sparked clashes with local authorities in Diyala so intense that the governor of Diyala and half the provincial council have fled to Kurdistan. Uh, now, the Irakaya bloc wants parliament to be dismissed and new elections to be held, a call that Malachi's office dismissed as untruthful and delusional. However, however, Irakaya is not the only voice. Um, the Al-Arar bloc has called for new elections. This is the bloc loyal to the Shia uh, cleric Muqtada al-Sadr, and the Al-Arar bloc is a significant player in the new alliance, the other major Shiite political party. So they've called for new elections. So has Musad al-Barzani. He's the president of Kurdistan or the Kurdistan region and he significantly is probably the strongest U.S. ally that there is in Iraq. Well, it's, it's still going on. Just on Tuesday, this is January 3rd, Tuesday, January 3rd, the members of the Arakaya bloc, uh, Arakaya bloc rather, uh, continued to uh, boycott parliament and uh, the cabinet. Uh, accusing Malachi of seeking to rule the country alone. Now, there is, however, uh, one possibility here. Uh, an Arabic source in Dubai says that Iraqi officials are actually working behind the scenes in order to cool tensions, and that, in fact, they've agreed in principle to a national conference sometime in January in order to work out their differences. Now, how those differences can be worked out is kind of hard to see, uh, Malachi's government is rife with corruption. Uh, it's been unable to generate development or jobs or deal with the grinding poverty still seen in too much of Iraq. Malachi has been accused by human rights groups of running secret jails, of widespread abuses, including torture of prisoners, and of jailing political adversaries, including journalists and peaceful demonstrators calling for government reforms. Nuri al-Malakai effectively runs the interior ministry and the security apparatus of Iraq. He has obtained control of formerly independent agencies that are responsible for running the country's bank, for running its elections, and, interestingly, for investigating corruption. And he has major influence on the courts. He's, what's more, he's been accused of having his own private security forces answerable directly to him. This is in direct violation of the Iraqi constitution. His control has even been extended to parliamentary procedure. Members of the Iraqi parliament cannot propose legislation. All legislation has to come either from Malachi's cabinet or the president. This is a restriction faced by no other parliamentary body anywhere on earth. The New York Times says of Malachi that his bland personality belies his mastery of Iraq's zero-sum politics and that, this is quoting them, he will help decide if his nation preserves its fragile democracy or if it will return to one man, one party rule. Based on the record so far, I have absolutely no doubt about which of those choices Malachi would make. And as I said last week, 
I do wonder how long it will be before our Nobel Peace Prize president starts talking about this, the security and stability that Malachi can bring to Iraq. Oh, and his one footnote to all that. Uh, employees of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, it's called the Green Zone. It's this big walled-in uh, enclave compound in, in Baghdad. They say it's still too dangerous to do any work outside of the Green Zone. All right, moving on to our regular feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, in this case, another front has been opened, or in some cases reopened, in the ongoing war against the poor. Nine years ago, a court in Michigan struck down the state policy that would require all welfare recipients to submit to random drug testing. Despite that failure in court, um, officials in Michigan want to bring it back. Under this new proposal, all benefits, all applicants for benefits from the state's family independence agency, it's called, would have to submit, and that's an appropriate word here, have to submit to a drug test. And adding, if you will, injury to insult, if it turns out that your pee is pure enough to satisfy the state, the cost of the test is deducted from your first benefit payment. So not only do you have to allow yourself to be treated like a suspected criminal, you have to pay for the privilege. This also means, by the way, that if you can't afford the cost of the test, if you couldn't afford that kind of hit, um, you can't get benefits even if you would have passed the test. According to the Director of Marketing and Public Relations for the state's Department of Human Services, and I really think that's wonderful, the Department of Human Services has a marketing director. Uh, but according to him, uh, the department has already done a feasibility study. Our research shows it can be done, he said. We have people in prominent roles here in the department who feel it should be done. No explanation was offered as to why it should be done. Why the default position is that people in need are drug addicts, and it's up to any person in need to prove that they aren't. Actually, that is one reason. That default position is one of the reasons why this is being done. It's a perpetuation of the ancient class bigotry of the haves who celebrate their, their, their superiority, their sense of entitlement, by telling themselves that the have-nots don't have because they are in some way morally or physically or mentally inferior. Oh, they're just lazy, they're just drug addicts, they're just whatever. Another reason, which is actually related to that one, is power. That, although they never say it this bluntly, but this in essence is what they're saying, we're going to make you pee in a cup because we can. Because you are in need, we can make you do this. We can make you demean yourself, lower yourself, sacrifice your dignity. We can make you submit to our arbitrary demands. We can tell you that you are not an individual worthy of respect. You're not a member of a society towards whom that society as a whole has some obligation. No, instead, you are a supplicant begging for the favors of your betters. You are not like us. I think it's not just Michigan. Not just Michigan. Demanding drug tests as a condition for public benefits uh, has become a staple of right-wing rhetoric. For example, in Florida, in July, Governor Rick Scott, or as I call him, Governor Voldemort, um, he began, re began requiring drug tests for all the state's welfare applicants until a federal, uh, federal judge issued an injunction against that in October. And it goes beyond even this. In 2011, 11 states... I'm sorry, a dozen states, a dozen state legislatures considered tying unemployment benefits to drug tests. Now, just like in the case of welfare, there's nothing beyond anecdotal claims, and I, and I won't say anecdotal evidence because that's not evidence. There's nothing beyond these claims that relate drug use to unemployment. And even some of those anecdotal claims proved to be farcical. Uh, uh, in September, uh, Governor uh, Nikki Haley of South Carolina, she went on about how at this one job site, 50% of the applicants failed a drug test. Until it turned out that at that job site, they don't even test applicants. They only test new hires, and only 1% of those failed. I say it again. This is all part and parcel of a campaign buy, an attitude among our increasingly out-of-touch elites that the poor, the hungry, the needy, the sick, the homeless, the jobless are not, as 
Charles Dickens put it in, a, in a, a Christmas Carol, fellow passengers to the grave, but rather another race of creatures bound on other journeys. They, or rather we, all of us who are not of the elite are other. I can only wonder how long it will be before the members of our smug class begin to ask of the poor, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are the treadmill and the poor law not in full vigor? And you know, all of this is without even considering the inanity of the drug war itself. This, this stupid and incredibly wasteful exercise uh, where everything from smack and crack to the occasional joint is lumped under the single heading, drugs. Peeing in a cup as a requirement for basic public assistance. That is the outrage of the week. All right, last thing I'm gonna have time for today, I think, Something else I said last week I wanted to go back to talking about was Occupy. Um, I want to start by mentioning something that was said, it was said the last week of December, where a government, a government official criticized the movement, saying protests were stoked by a hollow collection of leaderless opposition groups who just want to cause trouble. The problem is, the officials said, that they have no single program. They have many individual programs, but no unified one, and no clear way to reach their goals, which are also not clear, and there are no people who would be able to do anything concrete. Now, that, of course, is very similar to a lot of complaints that have been made against Occupy. Uh, no clear goals, no way to get there, and no leaders. Except the movement being referred to here was not the Occupy movement, and the official was not an American one. This was Vladimir Putin talking about the mass protest against his 12-year rule and the apparently tainted election that continued it. That his words could have come right out of the mouth of any number of right-wing and even supposedly liberal pundits here, that voices in these two different countries facing two different uh, uh, sorts of movements could sound so much alike tells us a lot about what the elites in all countries think about all of us who are not of that elite. I can only wonder if Putin went on to say they should all get a job. On the other hand, there are people who are genuinely sympathetic to Occupy, but who still wonder what it means, where it's going. Well, in response to that, I want to, I want to read the beginning of something that was uh, written by Marilyn Sewell. She's Minister Emeritus of the First uh, Unitarian Church in Portland, Oregon. I'm quoting here now. I am weary of hearing well-meaning friends question the Occupy Wall Street phenomenon. They ask, what do they want? They don't have any clear goals. How can they hope to bring about change? I want to ask, what was the meaning of Gandhi's fasts? What was the meaning of the Watts riots? What is the meaning of the young Syrian who set himself on fire because he couldn't get a job and started the Arab Spring? In other words, what is the meaning of a human cry? There comes a moment from time to time in history when a system is so patently unjust and cruel that people rise up and against it and say, no more. Sometimes the people have not worked out a p clear political agenda. Perhaps in their anger and pain, they have not sorted out the issues or chosen leaders or created a movement. Perhaps they never will. This does not mean their cry was in vain. What the Occupy movement will become, how it will develop, are things for the future to know. And for us, all of us, both as observers and as participants in the movement, are to discover as we go along. I'm reminded of a story by Pete Seeger. Back in the 60s, when uh, protest, uh, protest and folk music was popular, somebody complained to Seeger that people were writing new songs instead of, instead of uh, uh, protecting the old ones. And Seeger's response was, don't interfere with the folk process. Same is true here. Um, the movement, by the way, is not making headlines, but it's still churning along. There are still actual encampments going on. There's one in D.C., there's one in Louisville, there's still ones in other places. There have been protests from, in New, uh, from everywhere from New York City, where 500 people gathered in, in Zuccotti Park on New Year's Eve, uh, to Pasadena, California, where somewhere between several hundred and a few thousand marched behind the Rose Bowl Parade, um, to Hawaii, where a small group protested um, extravagant wealth over the fact that there were 12 private jets parked at a small local airfield. Here's a good one. In Dallas, Texas, the movement occupied a Westboro Baptist church protest. Now, this church, they're not a church. They're not recognized by any Baptist convention anywhere. So this church uh, came to, to the Cotton Bowl to protest because Penn State was playing there. They were met by 40 counter-protesters who mocked them mercilessly. And finally, the movement has been busy in Iowa. 
On December 19th, they protested at the offices of the State Democratic Party. Eight were arrested. On the on the 28th, it was Mitt Romney's headquarters, seven arrested. On the 29th, it was Ron Paul, five arrests. On the 29th, they were back at Democratic headquarters, 12 arrested. On the 31st, they were at the campaign headquarters of Michelle Bachman, Newt Grinch, Rick, I should be in a sanitarium, and Rick Perry, 18 arrested. On the 2nd, January 2nd, there was a die-in at the hotel where the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, had set up for caucuses, 12 arrested. And on January 2nd, a Romney campaign stop was disrupted. Three were arrested. And uh, just something about that, that last one, that Romney campaign stop, his supporters were yelling, get a job, go to work, which apparently the audience and Romney laughed about like this was some incredibly clever and original put down. But the paper quoted Romney as saying, ha, 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 hey, you guys, isn't it great to live in a country where people can express their views? Actually, Mr. Romney, yes, it is. It would be even greater to live in a country where leaders actually listened to and responded to those views. Now I got one minute left. Maybe something I'll do next week. I uh, don't have time for it now. Um, uh, one of our um, uh, uh, and another thing moments about why is January 1st New Year's Day? And why wasn't it for a very long time? All right, I'm just about out of time. I'm going to get out of here. Um, you just have the best week you possibly can. We'll see you back next week without news about the New Hampshire primary. See you next week.